Good morning. This is uh, January 3rd, um, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to the Orlando GI Journal Club. Our first study is um, from um, by Carson et al. from the New England Journal of Medicine. It is a randomized trial looking at a restrictive or liberal transfusion strategy in myocardial infarction and anemia. This is a little bit um, of an internal medicine issue, but uh, we are consulted a lot in patients with anemia and having a cardiovascular event, and we are asked to help manage either the medicine team or the critical care team with this issue. So I thought this was a really important study to discuss this morning. So randomized trials have shown um, that restrictive transfusion strategy, that is uh, keeping a hemoglobin uh, to a goal of seven in patients with anemia, um, results in decrease in blood use without differences in morbidity and mortality versus a liberal transfusion strategy. And um, anemia is a common issue in patients having an acute coronary uh, event. And indications for red cell transfusion remains controversial in these patients, and patients with acute MI may benefit from high hemoglobin level. The aim of this randomized trial was to determine whether risk of death or MI at 30 days differed between restrictive transfusion strategy and liberal transfusion strategy. So this was a multi-center randomized trial uh, conducted across 144 sites in the United States, Canada, France, uh, Brazil, New Zealand, and Australia. Um, adults um, having an active um, SD elevation MI or non-SD elevation, SD elevation MI and anemia, which was defined as hemoglobin of less than 10 within 24 hours prior to randomization, was included in the study. They excluded patients with uncontrolled active bleeding. And patients were randomized a one to one ratio to either restrictive or liberal transfusion strategy. Restrictive strategy is transfusion is permitted but re not required when hemoglobin falls below eight, and then recommended when hemoglobin falls below seven. And liberal transfusion strategy uh, was transfusion to maintain hemoglobin to um, greater than 10 until hospital discharge or at 30 days. And a transfusion um, consisted of administering one unit of packed red cells at a time and then measuring the hemoglobin after each unit. And um, the patients were followed for up to six months post-randomization. The primary outcome measure in this randomized trial was the composite of MI or death from any cause up to 30 days after randomization. So a total of 3,504 patients were included in this randomized trial. A total of 3,504 patients were included in this randomized trial, um, 1,749 in the restrictive and 1,755 patients in the liberal strategy uh, groups. If you look at, so if you look at um, the, uh, the types of um, patients who were enrolled in the two groups at baseline. The baseline hemoglobin was basically the same, 8.6 um, in the restrictive and 8.6 in the liberal group. Uh, the um, heart failure incidence was 21% in the restrictive group and 23% and in the liberal group. This is important because um, this will affect the um, the number of packed red cells to transfuse um, uh, because obviously um, if the patients are volume overloaded, um, they'll be limiting uh, packed red cells that are transfused uh, in patients. So these are the transfusion um, details. So if you look at the uh, restrictive strategy, hemoglobin was kept um, from 8.6 to 8.9. Um, and if you look at the um, liberal strategy group, the in the first 72 hours after randomization, the hemoglobin was kept um, between 8.6 and 10.5. If you look at the units of blood transfused, um, 
66% of um, patients in the restrictive strategy received no transfusion, and 34% um, of patients in the liberal strategy received three or more packed, packed red cell units. Now, if you look at the outcome measures at 30 days, which is the primary outcome measure, they looked at the composite of MI or death at 30 days post-randomization. Um, the um, rate of MI or death was 16.9% in the restrictive strategy group and 14.5% in the liberal strategy group. Now, if you look at the risk ratio between the two groups, uh, it's 1.16. Um, which uh, 1.16, which means that you are 1.16 times more likely to have myocardial infarction or death in the restrictive group compared to liberal group. However, if you look at the 95% confidence interval, it includes one, so it's one 1.35. And so this was deemed statistically not significant because if you look at the um, the constant confidence interval here, it does touch this um, uh, uh, risk ratio line here, uh, which spans one. Uh, if you look at the secondary outcomes uh, uh, component separately, which includes death, MI, um, the composite of death, MI, a need for revascularization or rehospitalization. Um, again, there was no significant difference within two groups. If you look at mortality um, by any cause, it was 9.9% in the restrictive group, 8.3% uh, in the liberal group. If you look at um, MI incidence, it's 8.5% in the restrictive group, 7.2% in the um, liberal strategy group. Uh, the limitation of this study was that the assigned transfusion strategy was not masked, what was not masked from healthcare professionals. Obviously, it's not going to be possible uh, because um, they will have to know the type of strategy that they are um, uh, assigning to the patients. And this may have influenced the use of revascularization or other interventions or classification of cause of death. The adherence to hemoglobin threshold of 10 in the liberal strategy group was moderate at 86% with lapse due to clinical discretion, such as concern about fluid overload. Now the take home point is that in patients with acute MI and anemia, a liberal transfusion strategy did not significantly reduce the risk of recurrent MI or death at 30 days. However, 85, however, 95% conference interval suggests a clinical benefit for liberal transfusion strategy with risk of MI or death at 30 days, uh, being 2.4% lower in the liberal compared to restrictive strategy group. Um, therefore, additional studies are required to confirm this conclusion. Now, our next study is another randomized trial from NEJM. This is looking at thalidomide for recurrent bleeding due to small intestinal angiodysplasia. Recurrent bleeding from small intestine accounts for 5 to 10% of cases of GI bleeding and remains a therapeutic challenge. Small intestinal angiodysplasia is the most common cause of bleeding in small intestine, especially in patients older than 50 years. Treatment of small intestinal angiodysplasia is a major therapeutic challenge with recurrent bleeding common after endoscopic or surgical intervention. Thalidomide has been shown um, to um, uh, be effective for treatment of recurrent bleeding due to small intestinal angiodysplasia. However, the studies have been small. And therefore, these authors performed a randomized trial to assess long-term efficacy and safety of thalidomide for treatment of recurrent GI bleeding due to small intestinal angiodysplasia. So this was a multi-center randomized trial. Um, it was double-blinded, which means both the participants and the investigators do not know which um, uh, treatment the uh, patients were assigned to. It's placebo-controlled, which means they are comparing an active treatment with a placebo. So in this case, it's thalidomide versus placebo. This was conducted in across centers in China, and they included patients with small bowel uh, angiodysplasia that was confirmed by video capsule endoscopy or uh, double balloon endoscopy, and who had at least four episodes of recurrent bleeding during the previous one year. They um, included women also of childbearing age if they had agreed to use contraception. 
and people, uh, patients randomized uh, in a one to one to one ratio. So this, this uh, randomized trial comprised three groups. So it was thalidomide taken at um, taken at a dose of 100 milligrams for 120 days. They actually administered 25 milligrams PO Q6 uh, thalidomide, total of 50 milligrams uh, Q daily. So these people, so these patients would take um, 25 milligrams of uh, the active drug um, twice, and then for the other um, the other two times, they would have uh, placebo, and then for the uh, placebo group, uh, they had the placebo. Um, uh, four uh, four times a day. Small so bowel bleeding was defined as the presence of overt bleeding or presence of positive fecal occult blood test, and they followed up these patients for one year after the end of treatment. The primary outcome was reduction of at least 50% in the number of bleeding episodes in one year compared to the previous one year. So these are the baseline characteristics. Uh, 51 patients were enrolled in the um, 100 milligram thalidomide group, 50 milligrams in the uh, thalidomide group comprised 49 patients and 50, sorry, 49 patients and 50 patients um, were in the placebo group. If you look at um, the median age, it was around 62 years of age. Um, a number of patients with bleeding refractory to double balloon hemostasis uh, therapy uh, was nine in the 100 milligram thalidomide group, 10 in the 50 milligram thalidomide group, and 11 in the placebo group. So these are the outcome measures. The primary and uh, the primary outcome measure was the uh, was defined as um, was effective response, which was uh, defined as. Um, um, decrease in uh, the uh, in small bowel bleeding in the one year post um, uh, treatment uh, completion of um, four months, and as you can see, thalidomide at both 100 milligram and 50 milligram doses was superior to placebo, so they were able to achieve um, uh, this effective response. Um, with the lidamide 100 milligram dose in 68.6% uh, .6 of patients, 51% um, of patients um, achieved effective response at the 50 milligram uh, the lidamide group, and um, the effective response was seen in 16% of the placebo group. And if you look at the relative risk in the 100 milligram the lidamide versus placebo, it's 4.29. Um, and then um, the relative risk is 3.19 in the 50 milligram thalidomide group. Um, next, um, when you're looking at other secondary endpoints, so this included cessation of bleeding uh, without rebleeding during the first follow up period. This was achieved in 51% in the 100 milligram thalidomide group, in 32.7% of the 50 milligram thalidomide group, and 4% of the placebo group. Um, again, uh, thalidomide was superior to placebo uh, when looking at the need for blood transfusion during the first follow-up period, significantly lower uh, need for blood transfusion in the thalidomide group at both doses compared to placebo, uh, requirement for hospitalization due to rebleeding during the first follow-up period, uh, again, was significantly lower in the, in the thalidomide group compared to placebo, uh, looking at um, number of hospitalization, uh, change in the number of hospitalization and change in the duration of hospital stay because of bleeding, again, was superior in the uh, thalidomide versus placebo groups. However, when looking at adverse events, they did encounter more um, adverse events in the thalidomide group compared to placebo, and if you look at the uh, total um, incidence of <clears throat> adverse events, it was 68.6% in the thalidomide group, 55% in the um, 50 milligram thalidomide group, and 28% in the placebo group. But none of the adverse events reported were serious adverse events. And the most common adverse event types included uh, GI disorders, elevated LFTs, uh, nervous system symptoms such as dizziness and limb numbness. 
The limitation of this randomized trial is that positive fecal occult blood test without hemoglobin decrease all those uh, requiring hospitalization was deemed un, um, may not be clinically meaningful. And patients with cardiovascular diseases such as aortic stenosis, which is a risk factor for angiodysplasia and hered hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia were not included in the study. Uh, also, um, uh, the study was conducted in China only, um, and therefore there is some lack of racial and ethnic diversity as a result. Uh, so the take-home point in this randomized trial is that treatment with thalidomide resulted in a reduction in bleeding in patients with recent, sorry, in patients with recurrent bleeding due to small intestinal angiodysplasia. Next is a randomized trial published in the Annals of Internal Medicine by Shak et al. This is looking at on block versus piecemeal resection of large colonic adenomas. The study is important because the optimal technique for endoscopic resection of lateral spreading lesions in the colon is controversial. Um, there are two techniques, endoscopic mucosal resection, which is usually performed piecemeal for these lateral spreading lesions. Um, they have low adverse vent rates, but um, their recurrence rates can uh, be variable. Uh, ESD, or endoscopic submucosal dissection, results in on-block resection of these lateral spreading lesions. However, they do have higher adverse events, um, but lower recurrence rates. And to date, there were no randomized trials comparing these two techniques for resection of lateral spreading lesions in the colon. So these authors have performed a randomized trial to compare recurrent rates between EMR and ESD in patients with larger benign colonic lateral spreading lesions. This was a multi-center randomized trial uh, conducted in seven centers in France, Obviously, it is not possible to mask the uh, investigators um, in the study because they are, ha they are having to perform these endoscopic resections, and obviously they are going to know what technique they're performing, but the participants were masked in the study, which means that the patients are not aware of the type of resection performed. They included all adult patients with lateral spreading lesions in the colon, so all lesions located at least 15 centimeters from the anal verge that were greater than 25 millimeters in size, with no endoscopic features suspicious for deep submucosal invasion. So patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio to endoscopic mucosal uh, resection. They performed piecemeal resection and snare tip soft coagulation was performed, which uh, has also been shown to um, minimize the risk of um, colon recurrence after EMR, um, you know, a separate randomized trial. Uh, and uh, the second group um, was endoscopic submucosal dissection in which on block resection of these polyps was performed. Uh, Follow-up was six months um, post-resection in which all patients underwent colonoscopy with biopsy of the scar being mandatory regardless of the endoscopic appearance of the scar area. The primary outcome was local recurrence at first follow-up colonoscopy at six months defined as positive adenoma biopsy or if there was obviously an adenomatous uh, residual tissue uh, visualized on resected specimens because they will be resected at the six month follow up. Um, 161 patients um, were um, assigned to the ESD technique, 157 patients were assigned to the EMR techniques. If you look at the lesion size, they were a uh, median of 40 mill millimeters in ESD, 35 mill millimeters in the EMR group. Uh, the majority of the polyps were in the right side of the colon, 77% approximately. If you look at uh, the Paris classification, the majority of the um, polyps uh, were um, um, 1S or 2A morphology. Uh, very few patients had the 2C Paris classification so, uh, zoology, uh, sorry, uh, Paris 2C uh, classification. Um, Next, when looking at the histopathological data in these polyps that were removed, uh, low-grade dysplasia was uh, visualized in um, around 29% in the ESD group, 39% EMR group, 
SSA cell rate lesions um, account, uh, accounted for 68% uh, of the ESD uh, group polyps removed and 7.1% of polyps removed to the EMR group. Um, cancer uh, that was superficial was encountered in 3.4% of the ES ESD group, 1.1% in the EMR group. And uh, deep submucosal cancer uh, was encountered in 4% in the ESD and 3.8% in the EMR group. We're looking at the primary outcome measure, which is recurrence at the first follow-up colonoscopy at six months post uh, colonoscopy, post EMR or ESD. The rate of recurrence was significantly lower in the ESD group um, compared to the EMR group at 0.6% recurrence rate in ESD compared to 5.1% EMR group. If you look at the relative risk, at 0.12 in favor of ESD. Um, we will be looking more at the adverse events in the next slide. And if you look at the overall adverse events, it was 39% uh, overall, 42.9% uh, ESD group, 35.7% in the EMR group. Um, if you look at the degree of adverse events, uh, the majority of adverse events were um, mild or moderate, although severe adverse event was encountered in 1.7% in the ESD in the ESD group, uh, which included intra-procedural perforation in 5.7%, post-procedural per uh, perforations in one patient, post-procedural bleeding in 7.9%, and post polypectomy syndrome seen in 12% of the ESD group patients. Again, if you look at the intra-procedural perforation, it was um, uh, lower, uh, although not statistically significant, because this relative risk is bound one, 2.2% uh, um, in the EMR group. post procedural bleeding was seen in 5% of the EMR group. And again, post-polypectomy syndrome was seen in 5% of um, the EMR group. The limitation of this study is that rectal lateral spreading lesions were excluded in the study, um, but this was done uh, due to likely higher rate of unexpected submucosal um, uh, cancer encountered um, in the rectum. Um, the authors included both tube adenomas and sessile serrated sessile lesions, added as it is believed that sessile serrated lesions are easier to resect than adenomas. Uh, inclusion of centers um, uh, in France only uh, in the study, uh, which influenced study logistics, such as use of intubation for clonic, complex clonic resections. The take-home point is that compared with EMR, ESD reduced six-month recurrence rate, which may obviate the need for systematic early follow-up with surveillance colonoscopy. However, however um, uh, ESD was associated with higher rate of adverse events. So uh, to recap, in patients with um, acute MI and, anemia, and anemia, a liberal transfusion strategy did not significantly reduce the risk of um, MI or death at 30 days. However, 95% confidence um, interval suggests a clinical benefit for liberal transfusion strategy with risk of MI or death at 30 days being 2.4% lower than liberal compared to restrictive strategy group. Uh, therefore, additional studies are required to confirm this conclusion. Treatment with thalidomide resulted in a reduction in bleeding in patients with recurrent bleeding um, due to a small intestinal angiodysplasia. Compared with EMR, ESD reduced six-month recurrence rate, which may obviate the need for systematic early follow-up with surveillance colonoscopy, however, resulted in higher rate of adverse events. Thank you so much. I apologize for my um, intermittent uh, phone calls during this journal club um, <laughs> today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our next uh, GI journal club is on February 7th, uh, 2024. It is the first Wednesday of February. Um, happy New Year again, everyone. I hope everyone has a wonderful, happy, healthy, uh, peaceful New Year. I really look forward to seeing everyone um, next month. Thank you again so much for joining us. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.